Hello, I'm Robert York, publisher and editor-in-chief of the Morning Call newspaper. Good evening and welcome to what promises to be a spirited Lehigh Valley congressional debate. We've partnered again this year with PBS 39 WLBT Muhlenberg College and the Greater Lehigh Valley Chamber of Commerce for this special event. Understandably, most of this year's attention is on the presidential race, but the people Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton will be working with on Capitol Hill also play a very important role in guiding our nation over the next four years. We at The Morning Call and TheMorningCall.com believe it's vitally important to keep Lehigh Valley voters as informed as possible in print, online, and, thanks to our partners, even on TV. Remember to vote on November 8th and enjoy the debate. Welcome everyone to the PPL Public Media Center at PBS 39, located at Steel Stacks in South Bethlehem and our 15th District Congressional Candidate Debate. The program's format encourages a lively discussion on issues vital to our community. We're joined in the studio by candidates Rick Doherty, incumbent Charlie Dent, and Paul Rizzo. Later, the candidates will get a chance to question each other, and we invite our viewers at home and in our live studio audience to join the conversation on Facebook and Twitter at MCall and at PBS39 channel using the hashtag ElectionLV. Let's start by learning a little bit about each candidate. Democrat Rick Doherty is 55 years old. He's single and has three children. Born in Allentown, he currently lives in Low Hill Township, Lehigh County. Doherty graduated from Moravian College in 1982 with a Bachelor of Arts degree in social work. He served as a district administrator for former Congressman Paul McHale and was a former chairman of the Lehigh County Democratic Party. Doherty currently serves as the executive director of Lehigh Valley Active Life, a local senior center. Republican incumbent Charlie Dent is 56 years old. He's married to his wife, Pamela, they have three children and currently reside in his hometown of Allentown. Dent graduated from Pennsylvania State University with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Foreign Service and International Politics in 1982. He earned his master's degree in public administration from Lehigh University in 1993. Dent served eight years in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives and six years in the state Senate before winning election to the United States House of Representatives in 2004. He serves on the House Committee on Appropriations and chairs the subcommittees on Military Construction and Veterans Affairs and is chairman of the House Committee on Ethics. Libertarian challenger Paul Rizzo is 42 years old. He's married to his wife Doris and has two children. Born in Easton, he now lives in Hanover Township, Northampton County. He attended Somerset County Technical Institute and has worked in the telecommunications industry for more than 20 years. Rizzo joined the Libertarian Party in 2012. He served as chairman of the Northampton County Libertarian Party in 2014 and 2015. Rizzo is currently a central office technician at Ironton Telephone Company. I'll begin the question and answer portion of the debate with one question for all three candidates. Each candidate will have one minute to respond. I'd like to know from each of you who you're supporting in the race for President of the United States why and why not, uh, or why not. And I'd like to see who would like to begin. I'll go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I'm supporting, uh, yes. I'm, I'm supporting uh, Gary Johnson uh, and Bill Weld as a vice presidential ticket. Uh, I believe they are the uh, best choice for America right now. Um, they seem to represent the values I would l like to see in government. Congressman Dent? Yeah, I'm like many millions of Americans right now who are very dissatisfied uh, with the choices we have for President of the United States. In a nation of more than 300 million people, we certainly can do better uh, than this. What I'm going to do, though, is make sure that uh, if I'm returned to Congress, the voters return me, I intend to go to Congress and be in check, a check and balance uh, against whoever that next president is. I will work with that next president, regardless of party. And when they're right, I will work with them. I'll, I'll work to fashion legislation in a bipartisan manner. But when they're going on the wrong track, 
I will, I will stand up and I will, I will vigorous, vigorously oppose them as well, regardless of what party they're in. So that's where I stand. Will you share who you plan to support? Well, you know, I, I might end up writing someone in. I'm still trying to figure out who that might be. Uh, I've thought a lot about it. And former Secretary of Defense Bob Gates, Condoleezza Rice, uh, John Kasich, who I strongly supported uh, in the uh, primary uh, for president. There's another one, Mitch Daniels, president of Purdue University, uh, and uh, uh, former governor of Indiana. All are impeccable individuals, in my view, would all be worthy of support. Mr. Doherty. I'm voting for Hillary Clinton. And I will be an independent voice in Washington. The reason I'm running for Congress is because I'm very concerned about our trade policies that I think have been a disaster. And I look forward to working with Secretary Clinton to reverse the trade policies that we have in place now, to renegotiate NAFTA, to renegotiate the WTO, and to make sure that we have a national policy that benefits us and benefits our workers first. Thank you each for your responses. Now let's begin the traditional Q&A segment of our debate. Our panelists are Laura Olson, The Morning Call's Washington correspondent, and Dr. Chris Borick, a professor of political science and director of the Institute of Public Opinion at Muhlenberg College in Allentown. Laura and Chris will start a question, start with a question for one candidate, but allow time for the others to answer as well. A conversation is encouraged and will rotate who gets each question first. Each candidate will have one minute to respond. Laura, let's start with a question for Mr. Dent. We'll start with foreign policy. Uh, Mr. Dent, um, how would you evaluate how the Obama administration has uh, performed in combating ISIS, and what role should Congress be playing in the ongoing fight against terrorism? Well, my view on the Obama administration's foreign policy is, is pretty straightforward. Uh, I, I believe that uh, many of our friends and allies around the world believe that America has retreated and retrenched whether it's in Europe, uh, the Middle East, or in the Pacific. Uh, vacuums have been created in that space, and they have been filled by actors that do not share our interests or our values. In the Middle East, those in th those, that vacuum has been filled uh, by countries like Russia and Iran, and we, saw, and we see what that has led to in Syria, with uh, hundreds of thousands uh, dead. Uh, the foreign policy that uh, I think we need, to, we need is one where America embraces its allies, make sure its allies understand where we are, make sure that they they know that we have their interests and that they have ours. Uh, also, we have to make sure that our enemies, uh, that our adversaries, uh, understand uh, that uh, America is still credible. Uh, there are many today who don't believe uh, that uh, America will meet its obligations and commitments. We see an aggressive China. Uh, we see ISIS, and on ISIS, I would say right now uh, we have to create safe zones. Uh, we have to create safe zones for, uh, to make sure that uh, uh, the people of Syria have a place uh, to live in, in safety, which they do not now. Uh, there's a great deal more we can do. We need do. to wrap up and okay. move on to Mr. Doherty now. Mr. Doherty. So the Middle East is an obvious turmoil. ISIS is in the middle of it. And I commend the Obama administration for delivering the largest ever military package of $3.8 billion to Israel because they're our staunchest ally in the Middle East, and that relationship and alliance has to remain strong. I agree with Mr. Dent that China is a growing threat and even more serious of a threat than ISIS. And the reason China is as strong as it is is because our disastrous trade policies. Every time you pick up something made in China, part of that is going towards the Chinese military. And that's what's happened over the last 15 years. And I think to be a leader and to look to the future and to identify serious threats that are coming around the corner is what Congress needs to do better. And in my view, the threat coming from communist China is the most serious threat that we'll be facing now and in the near future. Mr. Rizzo? Um, yes, I, I believe our foreign policy has been a disaster. Um, what we're looking at now is uh, we're arming people that we don't even know who they are. Uh, the, the Middle East is mired in, in turmoil, and we have a refugee crisis on our hands. Uh, we need to basically create safe zones. We need to put pressure on Middle East countries to actually take in the refugees and actually end the wars that are going on over there. I would advocate for actually disengagement from the Middle East. I think we've been involved too, too long with too many wars, and I think it needs to end. Chris, your first question is for Mr. Doherty. Thanks, Laura. Good evening, Mr. Doherty. Yes. Of all institutions of government, the United States Congress has the lowest public approval ratings. What, if anything, can you do to improve the public standing of Congress if elected to office on November 8th? I 
I think the general public is pretty clear that they see solutions are sometimes fairly simple to put forward and yet Congress seems to stumble over its own feet. And there's a couple of examples I can give you. The Congressional Budget Office issued a report in August that said to hold federal spending at 2% increases each year, which is where inflation is at this point, so it's an increase, without any additional tax increases, would eliminate the deficit in eight years. Social Security, if the wage tax was eliminated, similar to what we have for Medicare, Social Security is solvent for another 30 years. Trade policy, again, is, is another topic I'll come back to. When NAFTA has been around for 20 years and somebody in Mexico is making a mere $8 an hour in wages, it doesn't help us and it doesn't help the Mexicans. The American public sees it and they're mystified why Congress isn't able to at least tackle some of these solutions that would have major positive implications for us. Mr. Rizzo? Uh, I believe uh, Congress's approval rating is uh, warranted. Uh, as I think you said it was at 15 percent. Uh, I'm a reflection of this because I, I'm running because I'm upset with the way things are going in government. Uh, I think that the American people are not represented well and I think we need to get back to basics. Uh, what is going on in the country is lawmakers are passing bills that don't necessarily represent the American people and I would like to put an end to that. I think that there's too much corruption in Washington and we need to get back to basics. Uh, the two-party system has let us down. Congressman Dan. Yeah, it's a good question, Chris. Um, you know, I think we need people in Washington who have the capacity to find solutions. And there are a lot of people down in Washington who are very good at telling you what they will never do. And in a, in a, in a democratic system, we need people who have the capacity to get to yes, who can make an affirmative decision. I believe I have done that. Uh, I am often, uh, many of my colleagues often will say, you know, there are three types of people in Washington, Republicans, Democrats, and appropriators. I'm an appropriator, and that's often meant to be a, a derisive comment, but they say that because we're the only committee that has to actually put together a product every year and pass it into law. And uh, just the uh, last uh, two weeks ago, uh, my legislation on uh, military construction and the VA appropriations bill uh, was enacted into law. The first time an appropriations bill has been passed into law on time uh, since 2009. Uh, so I like to think I'm part of the solution. That same week, I had legislation that passed the House dealing with synthetic drugs. Uh, it's a poison that's uh, affecting so many people in our community. In fact, one person was murdered recently in Bethlehem as a result of that. So I've been working to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Laura, your second question starts with Mr. Rizzo. Trade has already been mentioned a couple times tonight. Um, can you talk about uh, the ways that you would evaluate international trade deals and with the Pacific uh, trade deal still pending, what specific ways do you think that would help or hurt the 15th Congressional District? I think ultimately it would hurt the, Congress the uh, 15th Congressional District. Uh, I think a lot of these trade deals that we've entered into have not served the American people well. Uh, one of the things uh, that the uh, TPP actually does is it gives corporations the right to sue sovereign, sovereign nations, and that, that infringes on the American sovereignty. Uh, that's one of the reasons I'm against it. Uh, a lot of the, some of the other reasons are is we really don't know what's in the bill. It's been fast-tracked. Uh, they've been negotiating it in secret, and we don't know if it's going to actually be necessarily good for us. Uh, we can look to some of the other trade deals that have passed in the before, like NAFTA, and uh, that has not been good for the American people. We lost over 50,000 manufacturing uh, companies with NAFTA. They say that we gained jobs, but the jobs that we gained were probably not the quality jobs that we lost. Um, so that's my position on that. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Doherty. So according to the U.S. International Trade Commission, so that's, that's us, all free trade agreements that we have currently, we're running a $180 billion trade deficit. There was a trade pact that Charlie supported with South Korea, and two years into that, our trade deficit with South Korea went up 50 percent. In 47, we got together with other industrialized nations post-World War II, and we set up trade policies that were working well. When NAFTA came, we hooked in a free trade agreement with the third world nation of Mexico. Mexico is in chaos. Drugs are coming into Mexico because of NAFTA much more freely than they were. 
And 20 some years into that agreement, Mexican workers are still paid at abysmal wages. It doesn't help them and it doesn't help us. China was, though, the biggest disaster when we allowed them to get most favored nation status in the World Trade Organization. And our trade deficits in 94 were about 100 billion. They've gone up to 800 billion. Now they're about 500 billion. It's a disaster. Mr. Dent. Sure. First, let me say this. Uh, trade must be rules-based. When rules are violated, then rules must be enforced. I support fair trade. Uh, but unlike my, my friend Rick, um, I have a real disagreement with him. Uh, he believes that America should retreat from the stage, that we should withdraw. Once again, vacuums will be created, and they will be filled by people who do not share our interests. China will fill that void. If the United States is not at the table writing the rules and setting the standards, the Chinese will. That would be the worst thing in the world for the American worker and for American industry. This nation has 14 trade agreements with 20 nations. We run a, a net manufacturing uh, trade surplus with those nations. Let's be very clear about that. Uh, you know, and you know, Rick likes to say that these trade agreements are all bad. Well, he, he can say that, but we need to open markets for American producers, manufacturers, farmers, uh, service providers. When, American, when the rules are set, we tend to do well because we knock down barriers for American producers. And that's one reason why I'm being supported by the National Association of Manufacturers and, and many in the farm community as well. So I think it's important that we open markets and not retreat from the world and let the Chinese set the rules and the standards which will decimate American workers and, and, uh, and industry. Chris, we're back to Mr. Dent for your second question. Thanks. Congressman Dent, climate scientists continue to indicate that the growth of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere are increasing average global temperatures. What policies, if any, would you support to reduce greenhouse gas emissions? Sure. Uh, first, the most important thing we can do on climate change, I believe, in the U.S., is to invest in basic research in the energy sector. Not try to commercialize, uh, not try to commercialize uh, uh, various technologies, but basic research. Uh, I believe, I, I have a strong faith in the marketplace that we will see uh, alternative and renewable sources developed at a reasonable cost. But in the meantime, though, we're going to have to accept the reality that we have to drill uh, for, for gas in this country, which has a lower carbon uh, uh, footprint, half that of, of coal and oil. Uh, my opponent opposes hydraulic fracturing. Even Democrats, uh, Governors Rendell and Governors uh, uh, Wolf support it. It's a matter of how we regulate it. But the point is, uh, we also need to do cost-benefit analyses in terms of climate change. What will be the domestic cost in terms of lost jobs, lost industry, and we have to weigh that against whatever CO2 mitigation benefit uh, that would be realized. That's what has to happen in these, in these discussions. But in the short term, basic research, for, and I support all the alternatives of, of, uh, and renewables of uh, solar, wind, geothermal, hydro. They're all good, but we're not going to be able to survive on those alone. We need, obviously, to move uh, uh, with, with uh, gas development to a much greater extent. Mr. Doherty? I support investment in renewable energy. I believe we should take a second look at nuclear energy. And we have to keep in mind that whenever we close a factory here, whether it's a steel plant or a cement plant or any type of a manufacturing plant, and it ends up in China, the level of pollution there is 10 times worse than what we would ever do. So even with global warming, bringing manufacturing jobs here where they would be under our environmental regulations would have a huge benefit. And so that would be probably the first thing I would look to be able to do. Because it doesn't make any sense if we allow China to continue to pollute as much as it does. The Paris Accord, very simply, China came out saying that in about 10 years, they're going to look to maybe begin to slow down how much they're polluting. Up until then, they'll continue to pollute as much as they want. It's going to get worse. And at that point, they'll start to think about it. And somehow that was cheered as a major accord, and I think it really was nothing at all. Just a really quick follow-up on yeah. that. You would not support the U.S. signing on to, as they have, the, the Paris Accord? Well, the, the part that includes uh, China, I think, is, is, is worthless. Um, th that's my point, Chris, is that as the number one polluter in the world at this point, China saying that in 10 years it'll consider trying to cut back a little bit really doesn't mean anything. And so my disappointment is how that seemed to be uh, put forth as a, as a great breakthrough, and I don't think it was really anything at all. Thank you. Mr. Rizzo? Uh, yeah. Uh, being a good steward of the environment is, uh, you know, very important. I believe in it. Um, you know, I try to live that way myself. 
but when we these guys are talking about how it affects the economy, I think it's important to look at some of the things that historically happened. Uh, I think it was in the 90s we had the Kyoto Protocol uh, that we never signed, but other countries did. And all the Western powers signed on for uh, binding targets, like all the Western European countries. Uh, the Asian countries, like uh, 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 China and some of the other countries did not sign on to these binding targets, and that actually gave them an unfair trade advantage with us. So I do believe that we need to be good stewards and actually take care of the environment, but it has to be fair across the board. Uh, so, Laurie, your next question will be our last question for the segment. Yeah. Uh, the Obamacare health care law has hit some snags, including some recent reports of private insurers who have dropped out of the exchanges. What changes to that law, if any, would you support if elected? Mr. Dockery. Is that to me? Yeah. Okay. Um, the Affordable Care Act is the public utility model for health care. Government creates the box, similar to what we do with electricity, and then the private sector is what delivers the service. Now, the difference, obvious, obviously, is that most of us, or all of us, realize we need electricity. But, and that's what makes that system work. But not all of us realize that we need health care. And especially those who are the healthiest among us probably think we don't. And so part of what I'm looking at as this law evolves is that as there is greater participation from more people, healthier people, younger people, I believe that it will begin to work itself out. There are bugs in the system that have to get fixed. I support extending the um, ban on the medical device tax. I also support religious institutions being able to not be forced to cover things that they object to. But the law itself, I think, is a move in the right direction. Um, Mr. Rizzo. Oh, okay. Uh, as, as far as the uh, Affordable Care Act, I, I think that it's been a failure. And uh, I can speak from experience. I actually had to uh, join it for a few months when I was laid off uh, a few years back. And, I didn't think that the uh, deductibles or anything, the coverage was that good myself, uh, but you know, it was about a $1,200 a month uh, rate for my family. Uh, that being said, I think the government has a lot of well-intentioned programs that ultimately fail us. So my view is I think that we should actually go back to the private sector. Um, if we look at some of the stuff that happens in the private sector as far as for uh, you know, like LASIK eye surgery and stuff like that, uh, the market competes and it actually makes the prices lower. So I'm all for private sector in health care. So would you get rid of the, the Obamacare law entirely? Yes, I would be an advocate for that, yes. Okay. Mr. Dent? Well, a lot to say here. The um, only thing I can say is that the law has increased costs, it's raised taxes, stifled innovation, disrupted coverages, and uh, beyond that it's working out just fine. In fact, uh, the actuaries are telling us this law is, is two years ahead of schedule in terms of collapsing. It will collapse two years ahead of schedule. And one third of the counties, about 31% th of the counties in this country, have only one insurance provider on the exchange. So what are we going to do to fix this thing? Look, we're going to have to replace this law. Uh, obviously, I support health insurance portability. I certainly want young people to be able to stay on their uh, parents' coverages. Uh, I also would uh, certainly want to make sure that no one with a pre-existing condition would be excluded. Uh, I support high-risk pools for those pre-existing uh, conditions to make sure that they have a place to go uh, to, to get insurance. And we also need medical liability reform. We have to lower the cost. This health care law is raising costs. Sky premiums are skyrocketing for people, as are deductibles and co-pays. This law is failing. As I said, it's going to collapse two years ahead of schedule. Now we turn to our audience for questions from Muhlenberg College students. We have a representative from the campus Young Republicans and from the Young Democrats. Each will ask one question of the candidates. Senior Kate Rail of the Young Republicans will go first. Each candidate has 45 seconds to respond. Mr. Doherty gets the first question. Good evening. Um, as a college student who's going to graduate in May, Increasing college debt is an issue that's really important to me and my peers. Um, as great as free college sounds, I was wondering what Congress could actually do in order to alleviate some of the burden on uh, recent graduates from some college. Well, first of all, I think college students should be able to renegotiate their debt. Um, I think the percentage, which I believe is about 6% at this point, is too high. It should be lower. 
I do believe that in terms of a free college education, it should begin with a community college. And for most of the four-year institutions in the Lehigh Valley, the credits that you can earn at a community college can be transferred 100% to the four-year school. It's a great way to test the waters, to see what you're interested in, and to find a career path. But I agree with you, there has to be better opportunities for students to get an education at a lower price. Then on the other end of it, you need to be able to find a job in your field that pays well. When we were in school, we got some debt, uh, but then we found employment. Um, I found employment about three weeks after I graduated and was able to pay that off rather quickly. So that's the other side of it, is when manufacturing jobs have been sent overseas, it not only affects lower skilled workers, but it, it affects everybody. Air Products and Chemicals just built a uh, plant in uh, China. And so they no longer need supervisors here, they need supervisors in China. So we need to bring all the jobs back so that everybody, high school graduate, college graduate, has a good shot at getting a good job. It's now Mr. Dent's turn to respond. Uh, sure, on higher education costs, obviously it's a big issue for everybody, students and families alike. Uh, as a member of the Appropriations Committee, I deal on, I'm on the subcommittee dealing with labor, health, human services, and education. Uh, we, we just enacted in the law last year uh, an increase in the maximum Pell Grant uh, to about uh, $5,900. That helps, but we also have to deal with the cost side. The cost of higher education is exploding. We can throw a lot more money in the Pell Grants, and many will say that's just going to fuel further cost increases within higher educational institutions. Uh, Rick just talked about free community college. Uh, I would disagree with that. Sure, there's nothing free. We're all going to be paying for this for the rest of our lives. But the point is, on free, free community college, why should my children get free community college? They don't need it. It should be need-based. Need uh, that's how we should... It, students with needs should be given the priority. And we shouldn't just focus on community college. But we have a... Uh, Mr. Rizzo went to a technical school, and we have to focus resources, too, and, and try to direct people into those kinds of careers as well, not in the post-secondary level. We have a lot of excellent programs, and uh, I've been doing a lot to work with veterans and other groups to uh, find funding for many technical training programs uh, so that people do go into that type of work. I think it's important, and uh, I feel very, very good about what we've done, at least on our committee, and what I've done on the, on the veteran side of the, uh, of, the, of the House as well. And the bottom line is we want to make sure people are educated so that they can find jobs when they get out. And the best way to relieve student debt is with people, with young people who get jobs when they get out. Too many are not finding uh, sustainable work. That's what we got to work on. Mr. Rizzo. Uh, okay. Uh, as far as uh, student debt, uh, just the numbers on it is we have $1.4 trillion of student debt in this country. We have 40 million Americans that actually owe uh, student loans. Uh, and I believe uh, that, you know, this is a bubble that we're looking at right now. Uh, how do we address it? Uh, some of the issues that we, or some of the solutions we could do is to help with uh, getting jobs for uh, people that have graduated. Uh, but the underlying issue is uh, pretty much that government got involved, helped build the student bubble, and now we have a humongous uh, problem on our hands. Uh, one of the things that people aren't talking about is the students are not allowed to default on their debts, and this is a problem also. They're, they're laden with this debt for the rest of their life. There needs to be some sort of reform on this where at least they could default uh, or have some sort of negotiation to lower the debt. Now, senior Jake Solari of the Young Democrats goes. Again, each candidate will have 45 seconds to respond. Mr. Dent, you'll receive the first question this time. Jake? Uh, thank you, and good evening. The United States has the highest corporate tax rate among industrialized nations at about 35%. Because of our high rates, tax inversion, or corporate relocation overseas to avoid the domestic tax burden has become common among U.S. corporations. Which do you think is the best way for the U.S. to raise tax revenue, and why? lower the corporate tax rate to remain competitive among foreign corporate rates or maintain a low repatriation rate and implement harsher penalties for movement abroad? Well, that's a good question, Jake. Um, first, I would say, when we have to lower the corporate rate at 35 percent, we're the highest in the developed world. It's not, not competitive, and that's what's driving uh, some of these inversions. Um, I would also tell you, too, that the United States needs to tax American headquartered companies on foreign profits the way our competitors do in developed countries. Uh, if an American company uh, earns a profit in, in, in Ireland uh, or, in, in, or anywhere in the world, 
we have to pay uh, the, the local tax in Ireland that I believe is 12 and a half percent but if the money is returned to the United States repatriated you have to pay the difference between 12 and a half and 35 percent a German company selling the same product in Ireland or making the same product in Ireland, selling there uh, they, they don't they take their profit home I mean, they, they don't have to they don't have to pay any differential so what we should do is lower the rate and move to a territorial system on taxation so that we're like the rest of the world and a lot of these inversions will stop we're finding a lot of American companies right now find it easier to invest in America as a foreign headquartered company than as an American headquartered company because of this screwed up tax system. Mr. Doherty. So the Government Accountability Office noted that 20 percent of big corporations pay zero in taxes and the Congressional Research Service noted that the average tax rate that our companies pay is 27.1 percent other industrialized nations their companies pay 27 percent so the statistic is there but we have so many loopholes in our tax system that many people um, some running for president don't pay anything so before we do anything with uh, the inversion and giving corporations another break we need to cut out the loopholes first and make sure that corporations are paying their fair share in 52 corporations paid 32 percent of our revenue in 2013 corporations now only account for 10 percent of federal revenue so the statistic is one thing but the reality is something else mr rizzo well i think the way to grow the economy and actually to create jobs is to get rid of the uh, corporate income tax uh... to be honest with you i know that you know what rick is saying as far as big companies are basically using loopholes to not pay corporate income tax that's probably true but what most small or most jobs come from small businesses so if we had small manufacturing that didn't pay any corporate income tax or a greater degree less corporate income tax that would stimulate job growth that would help get some of our you know, people that have graduated schools back into the workforce and paying down some of the student debt uh... you know we need to stimulate jobs here and that's the only way i really believe to do it is to make ourselves competitive with other countries we stay with our audience for one question from Danielle Bodner, Government Affairs Administrator at the Greater Lehigh Valley Chamber of Commerce. Again, each candidate will have 45 seconds to respond. Mr. Rizzo is up first. Danielle. Good evening, gentlemen. A new U.S. Department of Labor federal mandate will change overtime regulations that will neg negatively affect our members, our small businesses, institutes of higher education, and our nonprofits. As of December 1st, the Fair Labor Standards Act will double the minimum salary threshold for overtime from 24000 to almost 48000 Complying with this new mandate is not an option to many of our members. It will instead result in less paid hours and job loss. I ask that you please share with the viewers your stance on this new mandate and if you would do anything to delay or change the threshold amount. Mr. Rizzo. Uh, I'm not sure I understand the whole question, but what you're saying is that the, the government is mandating that you have to pay more overtime to people for uh, working more hours? or No, they're, they're increasing the threshold from 24000 to 48000 the minimum. Okay, so you would make over that for the minimum. I, I don't understand that. You're hourly under 24000 Okay. Your hourly, and then you're salaried over that. Oh, currently. no, I think that's wrong. Uh, uh, because if your salary, uh, you know, and I was a salary employee for a long time, I ended up working a lot of hours that, you know, I, I didn't get paid for. So I would be uh, probably against that. Then. Next, we'll hear from Mr. Dent. Yeah, I voted to delay this uh, very burdensome uh, mandate. Uh, doubling that threshold is unreasonable. Uh, and I raised this issue with Labor Secretary Perez in the hearing on, labor, on the Labor Subcommittee for Appropriations, and I, I asked him point blank, I said, Mr. Secretary, I know you don't care how this is going to affect small businesses, it's having a terrible effect, but maybe you will care how this affects local nonprofits, like the Allentown YMCA, which told me that it's not going to be able to manage this type of a mandate. It's going to disrupt how they have to operate, people are going to lose hours, people potentially lose jobs. The LGBT Center in Allentown, the director there said to me, we're not going to be able to hire uh, a development director because of this burdensome mandate. I mean, I could go on and on. Uh, Alan Jennings, who runs a community action uh, uh, center in the Lehigh Valley, 
uh, told me that this is caught in the papers said that this was going to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to his organization which is dedicated to alleviating poverty you know uh, housing assistance food assistance so this very uh, this 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 proposal is completely detached from reality you should simply mm -hmm. delay it and if not delay it just uh, just you could easily Time's index up. We need this to move on oh, to Mr. okay Dougherty. it's an important Thank question you. I support the proposal 100%. And I work at a nonprofit and I'm fine with it. Because what you're talking about is right now somebody making $24,000 a year could be asked to work 60, 70, 80 hours a week. And they're stuck because they're labeled as exempt. And for somebody to have that amount of pressure put on them and that amount of workload and to say they're even only getting $48,000, I think is completely fair for the worker and it was appropriate for the change and I support it. Now it's time for our candidates to question each other. And we like questions here, not speeches. Answers may be up to 45 seconds. We'll begin with Mr. Dougherty. You'll first ask uh, Congressman Dent, followed by Mr. Rizzo. Let's begin with Mr. Dougherty. So, Charlie, I was, I was surprised at our debate last week um, when you had mentioned that uh, you support term limits. Uh, Senator Toomey, as you know, has come out in favor of term limits, 12 years for a U.S. Senator, and six years for a member of the House. You've been in public office for 25 years. When would a term limit kick in for you? Well, as I said to you at the debate, that uh, I, I would support a term limit. I wouldn't apply it uh, unilaterally, but I think it would be a, a reasonable policy. I support the state level, and I support the federal level. Okay. Mr. Rizzo, your stance on term limits? I, I absolutely 100% support term limits. I, I believe there's been too many people that have been in politics way too long, and they don't represent us properly. Uh, one of the reasons I'm running is I would probably only be in office for one term and load and run again. So. Our next question is from Mr. Dent to both Mr. Rizzo and Mr. Dougherty. Uh, Rick, I was going to, you know, last time we debated here in 2012, uh, you know, we, you talked about the health care law, how it would reduce premiums, lead to rebate checks, and control spi the spiraling cost of care. Even uh, uh, former President Clinton says that this is, the, this is the craziest thing in the world. His words, not mine, and admitted that the law is raising premiums, cutting coverage for Americans, and uh, is crushing small businesses. Uh, given this, do you continue to stand by the health care law and what you call the public utility model, despite its admitted, uh, uh, admitted failures, and public utilities tend to see costs go up? So part of what happened, Charlie, as you know, is that initially there were a lot of people with serious illness that hadn't had health care coverage before that got involved in the system. And the Affordable Care Act had a provision in there to be able to pay insurance companies who were losing money more than what they took in premiums looking that this was going to happen. They're all losing money. And the Republican House, which you have the purse strings to be able to do, got rid of that funding. And, so you and want the, us to bail and, out the insurance the, companies then? During the transition period? Oh, yeah. Because you want us to bail out the insurance companies? For the transition period. Because it was very clear that there were a lot of very sick people who couldn't get health coverage were coming in. And so during the transition period, we were going to help the insurance companies mm -hmm. get through this time, and then they'd be on their own. But the Republicans cut that funding. Do you support a public and that's option? why, can I answer? I don't, does he have six questions here or one? Mm -hmm. So the Republicans pulled the funding. And that's why a lot of insurance companies are now pulling out of the system. Mr. Rizzo, your response on this issue? Uh, I don't believe that the, uh, the, the uh, Health Care Act ever was based off of uh, funding to keep coming into it to support it. I thought it was sold on the basis that it would support itself. So from that perspective, I, I agree with Charlie for not funding it. Um, you know, it, it hasn't been good for us. Uh, more insurers are pulling out of it uh, than going into it, and uh, they're losing money. And there's a reason, because the bill was flawed. So we need to actually reevaluate what we're doing and, and give uh, this back to the private uh, marketplace. Mr. Rizzo, your first question for your fellow candidates. Okay. We'll start with Mr. Dougherty. Okay. Congress has never passed a balanced budget on even cash basis since 2001 and has never taken any action uh, or, I'm sorry uh, under uh, Charlie's watch the national debt has skyrocketed from 7.5 trillion when he took office to nearly 20 trillion dollars would either of you support as I do a pledge never to vote for an unbalanced budget on a cash basis or generally accepted counting principle 
Do the question too. Mr. Hey. Doherty, we'll start. Uh, no, I wouldn't support that. Um, especially in times of national emergency, we would have to be able to uh, go into debt uh, to deal with whatever the situation might be. And as I had mentioned earlier, um, the Congressional Budget Office has in place that if federal spending is limited to an increase of only 2% over the next 8 to 10 years, with no increase in taxes, that we will get rid of the deficit. Um, and um, that would be the path that I would, I would support. Congressman Dent. Uh, yeah, first, uh, let me say, I, I believe we should try to move toward a balanced budget. I think within a 10-year window is realistic uh, right now. And as a member of the Appropriations Committee, you know, we're actually, I, I oversee about one-third of federal spending. Uh, that spending has actually been reduced. We are spending less today than we did in 2010, 2011, and 2012. Actually less, but that's only one-third of spending. The two-thirds of spending that's on autopilot outside of the appropriations process are the, uh, the so-called entitlements or earned entitlements or mandatory spending. That's what must be dealt with. Uh, and we have to deal with that in a bipartisan manner. I was one of the few people who uh, spoke uh, uh, supportively of the Simpson-Bowles proposal uh, that would actually establish a debt commission, it was a debt commission that would actually take positive steps uh, to try to rein in some of the uh, the entitlements and deal with revenue in a responsible manner, because that's where the growth is. As an appropriator, I've cut spending. It's not easy, and it's, and it's painful, but I'm only controlling one-third of spending. I can't uh, balance the budget on that one-third. We have to deal with it on the other two-thirds, and, uh, and so that's that's one way we could proceed. Moving Simpson on. Bowles is a starting point. Moving on to the next question, Mr. Doherty, your question for your fellow candidates. Um, for Paul or for Charlie? We'll begin with uh, Mr. Dent. Okay. Charlie, in 2014, you didn't have an opponent. You did not have an opponent in the primary, and you didn't have an opponent in the general election. Only your name was in the ballot. Yet you spent a million dollars to get reelected. What did you spend that money on, and why did you spend it? Well, first, I know, Rick, that you're very upset that you're not able to uh, get support for your campaign financially. Uh, that's probably. I, I've that's, got plenty of support for my well, campaign. That's, more than it, I need. Well, it's probably uh, the result of the fact that uh, you're not you're not getting a lot of support because people don't want to, uh, they don't believe in your candidacy. That's what you're you're upset about. There was about. a question and, uh, there. Well, yeah, there is a question. Sure, about I, I, spending I do, a million dollars, but I you spent a million money. dollars. You didn't have an opponent. What, I, I'm just saying, what, we put, what, we, what did you spend a million dollars believe on? Believe it or not, Rick, we actually sent out mail. We actually had to do go through a lot of motions during that campaign. We support other candidates. We do all kinds of work to support the infrastructure of the campaigns of not only myself but other other folks. Okay. Mr. Rizzo, would you like to interject? Oh well, yeah, uh, I'm running my uh, my campaign on a shoestring budget. Um, I'm proud of that. Uh, I think we need to keep money out of politics. Uh, I think money is uh, the corrupter of politicians. Uh, so, <laughs> what, what Rick is saying is. Uh, you know, spending money wisely is uh, smart. Uh, spent a million dollars, that's uh, quite impressive if you didn't have somebody running against, so. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, so that's, that's my opinion. Mr. Dent, we'll move on. You'll have the sure. next question of your fellow candidates. Sure. Um, uh, Rick, on the Bobby Gunther Wall Show, you, you described the job of a congressman as foolish. You called it a foolish job. Uh, I do not consider myself to be an important person, uh, but I strongly believe that the work of a representative in Congress is important uh, and an incredible uh, honor and responsibility. The work impacts people's lives, both positively and negatively. Why would you call the job of a congressman foolish? I think what's foolish about what congressmen do is they spend over half their time from the moment they get into Congress on the phone, begging for cash. I don't. Begging for cash begging for cash, but you spend a million dollars when you don't well, have an don't, opponent, well, which is even more bizarre. I don't spend that time. And so, to me... But why is the job of Congressman foolish? To me, because you're not doing the people's business. Because what you're doing is you're focusing on just getting reelected. Nine Over 90% of incumbents get reelected. And when they stop getting reelected is, is after they get the pension after 10 years and they cash out. There are such simple solutions that can solve the problems of this nation bring us back to prosperity, and they're right there, and that you guys seem to so keep the fumbling the you're ball. Saying, you're saying when the founders you should of this be, great country I'm, were foolish. Is, is, this is, uh, I, thought they wanted, I thought you wanted interaction here today. We, one interaction? We would like to move on and hear from Mr. Rizzo on this question. 
Um, I, I don't believe the uh, job of the congressman is foolish. Uh, I, I'm actually taking it very seriously, and I'm doing the best I can. Uh, I want to represent uh, the con our voters of the 15th district, and I think that I can bring, uh, you know, the regular guy perspective to what goes on. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm the guy that has to worry about putting bread on the table, you know, and uh, you know, this is very important to me, so I don't take it as a joke. Mr. Rizzo, your next question for your fellow candidates. Uh, since the creation of the Federal Reserve in 1913, the Fed has destroyed by inflation and money printing over 98 percent of the value of the dollar. The Fed is a quasi-private banking cartel effectively run by big banks where they create new money and get to use it first. Every year, the purchasing power of the dollar decreases and hits retirees the hardest. The Fed creates booms and busts, whether in the housing sector back in 2008 or the current auto loan and student loan bubbles today. Besides auditing the Fed, would you support abolishing the Fed and returning power to coin money back to Congress and restore sound money back to the people? We can begin with Mr. Dent. Okay. Uh, thanks for the question. I, I have supported, I voted to audit the Fed. Yes, I know. Uh, I would also tell you I'm very concerned about monetary policy in this country, too. Uh, I believe the Federal Reserve is trying to take on too much. Uh, you know, I thought they handled the financial crisis quite well under Chairman Bernanke. Uh, but I thought they've gone into they quantitative easing. They printed a lot of money. They though. did. They, they, uh, they've, they've gone on too long with this quantitative easing. Now they've tried to, to roll that back. But the Fed has two arrows in its quiver, uh, you know, liquidity and interest rates. We're very liquid right now, and we also have uh, very low interest rates. So in the event that we have another crisis, another uh, financial crisis or collapse, I'm not sure what the Fed can do beyond what it's doing now. They keep doubling down on the same policy. I think we need to move to a more normal monetary policy. We can't keep interest rates at this level for this long um, indefinitely, and I think there's going to have to be real movement here. Uh, that's my view. Mr. Doherty, your response? So, Paul, I support an audit of the Fed, and I do support having the Federal Reserve in place. I think it does have an important role. My main concern with currency is the currency manipulation that other nations do to us. And the Treasury Department very recently uh, noted Taiwan, Japan, South Korea, and Germany, as well as China, of course, as major currency manipulators. That has a huge damaging effect on our ability to export to them and making their products cheaper that has us lose our jobs. So when it comes to monetary policy, that would be my focus, and, well, to, and to correct that first. Okay, because uh, I think the uh, Fed is uh, manipulating our currency now with the It's called quantitative easing. Yeah. Mr. Doherty, your next question for your fellow candidates. The 2015 report to Congress on the U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission, this is the public report. There's also a, um, a secure classified report, Charlie, that you would have access to. It noted that we cannot defend against cyber attacks from China. China now believes that it can withstand a nuclear strike and retaliate, and China soon will be able to knock out every satellite in every orbit. Did you read the report, and what are you doing to protect this nation? Can uh, we begin, actually, with Mr. Rizzo and then hear from Mr. Dent? Okay. Well, <laughs> what we can do as far as with China is uh, attacking us? Is that what you're saying? Their, their military threat, because of trade, in my view, um, is to the point where now they're threatening us. And mm -hmm. those were three examples that the congressional report cited. Uh, that are very serious. Well, I think the biggest threat we have from China right now is that they hold so many of our, uh, homo so much of our debt. They can actually, they don't have to pull the trigger on anything except for our monetary policy, and that would do us in even quicker than uh, a nuclear strike. Uh, they have about 8% 8, 8 of our foreign debt. Yeah, but that's enough to, to do some damage. Mr. Dent? Well, first, I read lots of reports, and let me tell you, I, I've not seen one yet that said that any nation could withstand a major nuclear assault from this country. Uh, there are no winners in a nuclear war, including the Chinese, and that's one thing we all uh, want to avert. Now, Look cyber it up. Security, it's well, online. I, Anybody can read it. I guarantee you that if our nuclear arsenal would do damage anywhere, uh, if, it, if we were, heaven forbid, if it were ever released, uh, it's a very serious matter, and uh, there, there are no winners, and uh, I, I, I can assure you that many millions of people would be killed. Uh, now, that said, cybersecurity is a very real a, a real issue. In fact, uh, it's been brought out because one of our presidential candidates has been very lax in terms of her own email security, obviously. 
Uh, but, uh, you know, we have to move government-wide. We need to make sure that the private sector can feel comfortable sharing information with the government, and the government has to be able to share threat information with the private sector. Most of our infrastructure in this country is owned by the private sector, not by the government. Telecommunications infrastructure, energy infrastructure. Time is up. Well, that was quick. <laughs> We're going to move on to our next question from Mr. Dent for both of the candidates. Sure. Um, uh, Rick, at the last week's de debate, you stated that uh, directing resources uh, to our community would be one of your lowest priorities if, if elected. Uh, the, uh, the appropriations bill I wrote and that recently became law two weeks ago included funding for a, perim a security perimeter fence around the Fort Indian Town Gap uh, National Guard Center, which is in this congressional district, uh, because many military bases obviously are, are targets for terror attack. It was a priority for the military. Also helped secure funding for Route 412, which is right outside this, this, this room. Also improvements, uh, also uh, money for the bridge at American Parkway in Allentown. Why do you think it's not your constitutional duty uh, to work to ensure that our district gets its fair share of resources, no more nor less? Uh, wh why would you think it's not important for a congressman to advocate for his district in terms of federal resources, since we pay taxes? I'll advocate, but it's a lower priority. As I said, my, my reason for going to Congress is to change trade policy. And in the 115th Congress, that's going to be possible. Fast-track legislation passed by only one vote. Congress is evenly divided on trade. Both of our presidential candidates want to reverse the disastrous trade policies we've had. The question wasn't that, trade, but the... No, what I'm saying is the, the question is about priorities. So I would look to bring... You want the Chinese to write the rules I would look out. to bring... We, we, we become isolated. He's make, asking make more isolated. questions again. I'm trying to give an answer. But you're back Mr. Doherty. Can I give an answer? Yeah. I think he's asked about 50 questions. So my answer is... I'm going to look to bring projects back here, Charlie, but it's not going to be my priority because I'm not looking to make this a career. I'm not looking to have ribbon cuttings and get my name in the paper so I can be in Congress for 12 to, to 15 traffic years. Out here. That's all we're trying to do. I will do that too, but it's a lower priority. That's my okay. point. Mr. Rizzo, your response okay. to this question? Um, well, it's an interesting one, and I think uh, one of the main things is the money we send to Washington, and we never seem to get back as much as we send to Washington. Uh, you know, as far as with the roads that Charlie just brought up, uh, the Highway Trust Fund, I think 25% of that gets allocated to other projects that are not, have anything to do with the roads. Uh, the, so I would say that, you know, we obviously want to fund that stuff through state and local government, anything that would be, you know, like that. So uh, I think we need to basically make sure we're good stewards with the money, have it come back to the uh, you know, congressional district and make sure it's spent appropriately. That was the last question. We are out of time for that segment. Our last piece of business in this debate is a 45 second closing statement from each candidate. We'll give the challengers the last word and start with Mr. Dent. Well, you know, uh, opinion writer uh, Mike, Michael Gerson recently wrote an excellent uh, uh, op-ed so when you have contempt for politics, you often get politics worthy of contempt. And, you know, I, it disturbs me. I'm so concerned about our p political system, uh, the demagoguery that goes on. And uh, what I've concluded is that we need people in the U.S. Capitol who know how to work together in a way that to find solutions to problems. As I said earlier in this debate, there are too many people who simply can't get the yes. They're good at telling you what, you, what they can, telling you what they can never do. I pledge to go down there and work to find solutions to problems and to work in the best interest of this people, this community, this commonwealth, and this country. And with that, I thank you and I respectfully ask for your vote in November. Thank you. Now we'll hear from Mr. Doherty. I'm running for Congress to bring our jobs back. That's the solution to most of our problems for working families and the middle class. Congress is the one that passed legislation beginning with NAFTA and then allowing China into the WTO that made it almost impossible for Americans to be able to manufacture things here like we used to. Congress is evenly divided. Elect me and a few others like me, and we'll be able to reverse trade policy, we'll bring jobs back, and we'll provide prosperity for more Americans. Home ownership is at the lowest rate it's been in decades, labor participation is down, and it's all because of our jobs going overseas. It can change, it's my top priority, I ask for your vote. Thank you. Finally, Mr. Rizzo. 
Uh, I'd like to uh, thank Channel 39 for uh, hosting this debate and uh, inviting me. Uh, I'll leave you with this. Uh, when we look here at Rick and Charlie, I think we can honestly say we've seen this show before, and we pretty much know what the results will be. Uh, we're going to have more government spending, more bad trade deals, and more legislation that constricts business than promotes it, and the further erosion of your civil liberties. In this year's election, when you go to the ballot box, think of this. You can vote for the illusion of a choice, or you can vote for real change. I'm Paul Rizzo, and I humbly ask for your vote this November. Eighth. That concludes our 15th District Congressional Candidate Debate. PBS 39 would like to thank the, thank the candidates for participating, our panelists Laura Olson and Dr. Chris Borick, and our partners, The Morning Call, Muhlenberg College, and the Greater Lehigh Valley Chamber of Commerce. Election Day is November 8th. Thank you. Emmy and Tony Award winner Kristen Chenoweth, Coming Home. A career spanning concert recorded live in her hometown of Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. Kristen Chenoweth, Coming Home. Tuesday at 8 on PBS 39. On Masterpiece. Yes! Just hold my hand. Who lives here? The Prime Minister. To the path. Tell Papa I love him. Churchill's Secret on Masterpiece. Wednesday at 7 on PBS 39. I declare today to be PBS 39 Peace Poll Rededication Day. PBS 39 celebrated the United Nations International Day of Peace by rededicating its Peace Poll. Peace Polls are recognized and it's a prominent international symbol and a monument to harmony. They represent the oneness of humanity's wish for a world at peace. Dignitaries from the City of Bethlehem and the United Nations, as well as students from Donegan Elementary School and Lehigh Valley Charter High School for the Arts, participated in the festivities. May peace prevail on Earth. PBS 39, together we can be more. Discover Lehigh Valley with the Northampton County Calendar of Events. Bach at Noon takes place October 11th in Bethlehem. The Runner's World Half Marathon and Festival is October 14th through the 16th in Bethlehem. Harry Rinker Appraisal Day takes place October 15th at noon at the Hellertown Historical Society. And College Hill Concerts features Frank Kimbrell, October 16th in Easton. Special celebration of American folk music. Michael Rowe, the Polish Shaw. There's a meeting here tonight. There's a meeting here tonight. I know you by a friendly face. There's a meeting here tonight. Saturday at 10 on PBS 39. Why should your business become a PBS 39 sponsor? PBS 39 viewers value, trust, and appreciate public broadcasting because of the services PBS 39 provides. Content that expands the minds of children. Documentaries that teach us about our region's past and present. News series that keeps them informed. And programming that brings local arts, theater, and music directly into their homes. Engage the PBS 39 audience and associate your business with the trusted PBS 39 brand through program sponsorships today. Call the PBS 39 corporate sponsorship team now at 610-984-8122. On Masterpiece, the Royal Simla Club's Fashion Parade. 
Tell me where my wife goes, who she speaks to. What have you told him? Indian Summers on Masterpiece. Wednesday at 9 on PBS 39. There's ordinary shopping and there's the outlets at Sands Bethlehem with over 25 big name stores featuring a variety of designer fashions and a wide array of finds for your home. There's something for almost everyone at the outlets at Sands Bethlehem. The PBS Arts Fall Festival was made possible in part by a generous grant from the Anne Ray Charitable Trust and by viewers like you. Thank you.